two major challenges in Iraq today. The physical state of the country, which is very, very poor. And I never, if you never heard me speak over the years, I would always, always say that Iraq was never a third world country. And only some of the conditions came close to that during the years of the sanctions. And you know, it's only when you're in Iraq that you realise how heavy and biting those sanctions were. The people talk about those UN sanctions uh, during the 1990s as the silent war because it had the same impact in terms of deaths, illness, uh, devastation on the Iraqi people. So other than that, the, the actual uh, conditions of life in terms of uh, access to food, health, education, etc. were comparable to other first world countries. So in the last two visits I've had, I was quite saddened to see Iraq deteriorate into conditions that I would equate with a third world country that I would have seen in say, my travels in Asia and in India and places like that. So this photograph has a bit of irony to it. You have an oil building, an oil company building in Basra in the south of Iraq, and in front of it, uh, at the foot, is the slums. Now, as I was being driven around um, Basra uh, by my host, Dr. Ahmed, he, he almost cried. It was almost a sense of shame, and he said to me, Donna, this was never here before. Like, don't think that we always lived like this. Yeah, he was so proud, he didn't want me to, he wanted me to be sure that we, you know, we never made people live like this before. This is new. The people have had to come from um, the countryside and move into the city. He said, it never looked like that. And if any of you have seen photographs of Iraq before 2003 or been there, you would know what he's talking about. Of course, in Basra, the environmental catastrophe that began in 1991 continues to this day. One of the most pressing issues in Basra today in the south of Iraq is uh, environmental pollution caused by the toxic remnants of war. So I'm talking about 400,000 kilograms of weapons containing uranium that have been unleashed on Iraq in both 1991 and 2003 and 2004. Of course, Basra was the first place that suffered the impact of depleted uranium weapons. And yet, it's gone, it went quiet. You know, throughout the 1990s, we heard about the dramatic increase in birth defects and deformities and cancers. And it seemed to be quiet. It's almost as if it had gone away or got better. It hasn't. And this children's cancer hospital, I mean, what city has a cancer hospital just for children? Just because there's so many uh, children with cancer that they don't fit into the, the traditional city hospital. All these children are dying. They'll be dead within a couple of months. There were many. And this is not going to go away for another half a billion years. The remnants of war, um, the tanks, uh, all the artillery has been lying on the ground in South Iraq for a very long time. Cleaning up has begun and they have moved some of the tanks, but you know, uh, metal recyclers were encouraged to go and use the tanks to recycle and it became a bit of a trade, a bit of a business. And so when they recycled the metal, much of it ended up in homes. So you could imagine, as I said, how long this toxicity is going to impact on these people. It's a lot of, it's all, a lot of people talk about, we, we, we interviewed many doctors and professors in Basra and they were, some were afraid to speak to us. They said, we cannot speak freely on this issue because the government will, there will be ramifications for us. One, uh, Dr. Jalad Al-Ali, some of you may have heard his name in reference to this topic, um, has been, how do I say, retired early because he'd been outspoken on this issue. Pollution from the oil and gas industries is huge in Basra. Of course, you've got these companies exploiting the local resources and you have very little protections for workers and workers' conditions and pay are very, very poor. And one of the few good things happening in Iraq today is the trade union for oil and gas workers that is mobilising now uh, and striking and, and really putting up a great fight to demand better conditions from these oil and gas companies. The pollution is just terrible. You can barely breathe in Basra. Again, this is what I would equate it to India or Asia, uh, never Iraq, but this is what conditions people are living in now. This is the road between Basra and Najaf. You know, 
Back to, uh, Iraq used to be covered in palm trees. You know, that's the image of the Middle East, but he's one little lone palm tree, which just was a symbolic for me. There's some, this, the Basra University want to do a massive uh, palm tree planting project. I said, well, how many would you need to get it back to usual? They said, well, since the goal, uh, 1991, they said we'd need about two million to be planted to balance the environmental degradation done by the toxic remnants of the war. This is Najaf. I only put in this um, photograph of the uh, Imam Ali Mosque in Najaf, not just because it's one of the major religious holy sites of Shia Islam in the world, but because this is the place that now runs Iraq. That is no understatement. If you're a politician in Iraq today, if you're in the Shia uh, coalition that's running the place, mind you, the Shia coalition that's running the place under Nouri al-Maliki was not the coalition that received the highest numbers of votes in the last election. I go, hang on a minute. It was meant to be a democracy. Yeah, that's what the Iraqis say as well. They would have been pleased, perhaps, if the coalition that received the highest number of votes were installed, but they were not, um, well, they were not acceptable to the US at the time. And so they now, they thought this minority government is running Iraq and running it with an iron fist. So uh, nothing is done without the approval of the religious mullahs and clerics from Najaf. And of course, uh, the Alistair Stani said, there you have the Iranian influence. Of course, the greatest irony there, that Iraq is basically being run from its greatest enemy, Iran. This is Fallujah now. Of course, you know, I've had a long history with Fallujah, and I spent a week in Fallujah hospital again this trip. Last trip, I had photographs from babies born every day with um, congenital birth defects from the use of toxic weapons, is the, um, it's alleged. Um, today, uh, this trip, I also have uh, babies born each day. I'll just flip through. Mm -hmm. uh, his older child, obviously, there. The thing with Fallujah is um, the US forces have denied using depleted uranium there. They, after a freedom of information request that took um, years for them to answer, their answer was officially that no depleted uranium weapons were used in the November 2004 attacks. Okay, believe that if you want to. But they said for the April 2004 attacks, they said there are no records. <laughs> I'll leave that thought with you. <coughs> what we do know is the baby's safe. He'll be dead within the next two months. What we do know about Fallujah is that the use of white phosphorus was widespread. Basically blanketed the city by the end of the, uh, the two attacks. White phosphorus is banned on the Chemical Weapons Convention as a weapon. They got around it by saying that we, we, didn't, we didn't use it as a weapon, we used it as an illuminator. But we know that by the time you throw a white phosphorus canister into a room to illuminate it, and by the time you get in there to check who or what is in there, the flesh of the people in that room has just burned off their bodies. There's been no long-term studies into the impact of white phosphorus on human health. The other two large instances of white phosphorus being used is by Israeli Defence Forces in Gaza and in Lebanon. And there still is not good research on the impact of that on those communities or in Fallujah. This is a little baby I met on the second last day. I thought, he's not going to make it. He was finding it so hard to breathe. His mother was in shock. She'd left the hospital. Poor little thing. He died by the end of that day. It's just a daily occurrence in Fallujah. So many questions. I don't know about you, but I think this demands not silence, but just an urgent response in terms of Inquiring, asking the question, investigations, research, behind this. This is the Mardis Cemetery in Fallujah. Of course, everybody buried here is, is death is connected to the 2004 attacks. These pictures are the saddest one, these gravestones. That word, for those of you who read Arabic at the top, is child. So it's just these are the children's graves. All of that's the children's section. When I say children, I mean the babies. Either the babies born dead or the babies who live just a few months. These graves here are significant because Fallujah has been at the centre of resistance against occupation for a very long time, since 1921 against the British. But recently you may have heard about the massive anti-government demonstrations going on in Iraq every week. It's about a quarter of a million people every week, although it's kind of gone off the radar, if ever it was on the radar of the Western media. In Fallujah, uh, it's probably about four or five weeks ago now, um, uh, Iraqi army fired into the crowd and shot five of the protesters dead. And so these five graves you see there are the graves of those young men who died. There's a, been demands for an inquiry into 
the deaths of those young men. The government has said, yeah, we'll get around to it, and that has not yet gone. Hello. So, this is Ramadi. Uh, Ramadi, of course, on uh, Angal province, not too far from Fallujah. So, we went to visit um, the demonstrations. Um, it's pretty disturbing that uh, especially no foreign media there. That is not entirely the fault of the foreign media because the fact is it's very hard to get there. Why? Because our Maliki's government is cutting off all roads into Ramadi and Fallujah every Wednesday evening from Thursday through to Friday afternoon. No one's permitted to move between Fallujah, Ramadi and Baghdad. So the foreign media often just can't get there. When we were in the Fallujah hospital, we were told by the doctors that CNN had tried to get to Fallujah the day before and had been turned back because of roadblocks and checkpoints. So not even CNN could get through. So this isn't getting a lot of coverage. As you can see, these tents, there's about 80 to 100 tents, each one from one of the tribes around Amber. They're set up on the highway between Jordan and Baghdad, and they ain't going nowhere. This is more than a tent city. This is a city. Um, we stayed in one of the tents for a couple of days, and... They're, they're set up. <laughs> they've got everything there. They've got the wireless internet, they've got the showers and the toilets and the restaurants and the tea. And, and this is going to be on that highway, these protests, these demonstrations for a long time. What are their demands? So they start off with the prayers every Friday, doing their prayers. And then um, after the prayers, they're all very polite during the prayers and not quiet. Then after the prayers is this. And then the chanting begins and the political speeches. Although it's um, generally been non-violent except for the Fallujah incident. So generally the, the protesters are not um, acting in any way that's violent. Uh, it's just basically the chanting. So the demands of the protesters uh, are generally about the, the discrimination they feel by the Maliki government, uh, but more specific things as well. So human rights violations going on. One, the fact that there's about 5,000 prisoners currently in Iraqi prisons without a charge. Uh, and certainly without a trial. So they're asking for either those to be released or that they be charged or expedited to a trial. This is a um, very terrible practice in Iraq today, and that is if um, someone's suspected of what they call terrorist activity, if they go to the house to arrest the man, if the man is not at home, they will then proceed to arrest uh, the wife or the sister of the man. So there's now about 500 Iraqi women in prison who are guilty of nothing except being related to someone who's under suspicion. You can hardly believe it. I, mean, I don't even know if Saddam would have got away with that. So speaking of Saddam, so Jim Mullen says, well, you know what, Jim Mullen, Tony Blair and John Howard, I think they're the three we're going to hear it from. I don't think there's many others who are in this non-reality. But these three men this week, and I'll finish now, how am I going? I had a good old wind up. Five minutes. So, they're going to say, you're going to hear it over and over again, well, we've heard it all these years, but the world's a better place, and Iraq is a better place. Now Saddam is gone. Well, you know what? When I'm going to be asked that question again in the next few days, Donna, isn't Iraq better with Saddam? I'm going to ask the interviewer, maybe they would like to complete the question. What kind of a question is that? It's implying ceteris paribus, all things are equal other than Saddam is gone and that everything else remained the same. What about the trade-off? What about the accounting? Okay, on one, uh, one side of the account, Saddam is gone. What has occurred then in order to, for, for that to have happened? Ah, now the question gets interesting. Now it gets a, bit, a little bit complicated and not so black and white. I wonder if any of the media will dare to ask the complete question. Donna, in light of what has happened now in Iraq today, a foul dysfunctional state with a Prime Minister moving into the brutal dictatorship, torture chambers beneath most police stations, um, human rights violations every day, you risk your life to be a journalist in Iraq today, you risk your life to speak out against the government. In Basra, where I was, there was a man who wanted to organise an anti-government demonstration in Basra. That's a big thing for Basra because generally it's considered pro-government. As he was announcing his uh, demonstration and inviting people to come and he made a flyer and started to distribute it, he was arrested. He was held in the prison and he was asked to renounce the demonstration and to withdraw those flyers and the invitation. He wouldn't do that, so by the third day, they had um, made up a list of threats to his family that they would implement. So by the fourth day, 
He succumbed and signed a piece of paper to promise that he would not organise those uh, demonstrations. Welcome to the new Iraq. Feels very much like the old Iraq. Democracy, they say. Well, you know, when you mention the word democracy in Iraq, it generally, uh, it, the reaction is either disbelief or a belly laugh. Democracy. Okay, so is Iraq a better place without Saddam? Well, it depends. Do you think Iraq is a better place now that, um, for example, Al Qaeda uh, uh, cells are roaming free in Iraq, planting bombs? It's been about three or four in the last week, um, probably about 150 people killed. Of course, Al Qaeda never had a foothold in Iraq before 2003. Um, there was never such a thing as a roadside bomb or a car bomb or a suicide bomber. So, Jim Mullen and the rest. Do you think that Iraq is better now that it's um, uh, al-Qaeda terrorists with their extremist Islamic um, theology and beliefs uh, and their support of violence? Do you think it's a better place now that they're roaming free? I think Iraqi people have an answer to that. That's very, very clear. So I would also ask them, do you think Iraq is a better place now that minorities that live freely and thrive in Iraq, I'm talking about Iraq, the minorities that made Iraq such an amazing multi-ethnic um, place and multicultural place such as the Mandayan community, Sabians, the Christian community, which was Armenians and Chaldeans and Assyrians, the Yazidi community, the Shabak community. What an amazing mix and melting pot of history and significance in the ancient Mesopotamia. Four of the five groups that I've just listed have been now declared by anthropologists as on the brink of extinction in their home area. Okay, well, Saddam's gone, but okay, it's overrun by al Qaeda and terrorism, and also extremists have taken over in terms of um, these minorities being able to live and thrive. Uh, if you're a woman in Iraq, you might have an answer to that question. Uh, a woman who has had her legal rights under the Constitution dramatically reduced, you now might be harassed and beaten on the street if you walk around the way you used to dress before 2003 without hijab. And, um, and perhaps you uh, aren't able to go to university because there's certain fellows who stand outside the university, they call themselves the uh, religious police, who will harass women so that they don't enter the university. Okay, is that the new Iraq? Is that acceptable? Of course, the new Iraq is so challenging and awful and dark and violent and insecure and unstable and dysfunctional to about 3 million Iraqis, so bad for them that they choose not to live there, but instead to live in squalor and poverty as refugees in neighbouring countries such as Jordan and Syria. Of course, some of them make, that, make the trip to Indonesia and Malaysia, and then some end up in a desert island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean called Nauru. But, Many of them, I think, Martin, you might confirm or deny this, would prefer that desert island to what they fled, to what Howard and Mullen claim is the bright, shiny new Iraq. I don't know about you, but I think I know whose opinion I'm going to listen to when there's a judgment on the legacy of this invasion and occupation. I think Iraqi voices are rarely heard their opinions are not sought, but their opinion to me was loud and clear. They said, Donna, we used to have one Saddam. Now we have hundreds of Saddams. The political parties and their thugs and militias who are roaming the streets, the so-called sectarian violence, which is just political violence, their infrastructure crumbling, power three to four hours a day, $60 billion squandered, the corruption of the government, human rights violations, not, nothing much has changed except they said at least Saddam could keep the lights on and we were safe. I'll leave it up to you when that question is posed, well, is Iraq a better place? When you look at the other side of the ledger, the answer is definitely not black and white.